Okay, good morning, everybody. Here we are, yet again, Baruch Hashem, with Lizzie and Mishakela, full devotion. Today, we will also, if we get to that point, but I'm, I just keep giving everyone a warning that we're going, we're, at some point, we are going to use this safer. So if you have it at home, you can pull it out. I can't promise we'll get there today, but I hope so. Um, so, okay. So I want to make sure we don't lose the flow because there's the, there's the balance between focusing on the details of each ice and realizing what each chapter has to say to us, but also realizing that there's a greater perspective that the Rabbi is trying to give us. There's a greater flow of the mimer. So just to give you guys a reminder, I'm not going to go through every single one, but just to give you guys a reminder that at the beginning of the Mimer, this whole thing started with a Pasuk. We're trying to analyze a Pasuk and we're trying to learn something from this Pasuk. Now, we went into it and we, we had to understand certain things in order to understand, A, that our life decisions, our work on ourselves, what we do with our time makes a difference, not just in the levels of Hashem that are within His power to create, meaning like his external externality, so to speak, you know, kind of like what I said about getting dressed, right? So if we get, if we're having a hard day, we get dressed in especially nice clothes, it like boosts us up. Does it change us in the depths of the insides of us? Not necessarily, but it gives us like a bit of a boost. So we do make an effect in Hashem's external sense, so to speak, like the, the externalities of Hashem, which is Seder Stalshus, but also we, we realize through the Mimer that we also make an effect in his death in like in his in he himself we actually do connect with him and we do so in such a way that that it impacts and like it's just such a sweet and loving thing that you can know that that what your decisions are do make a difference not just make a difference to make the world a better place but you make that relationship you make that bond you make that connection with hashem and it really touches him in the depths of him so there, we definitely discussed it in a lot more depth, but then we had to understand, okay, well, what does it mean? What do I actually have to do in order to connect to Hashem in such a way? How, what do I have to do in order to, to, you know, bond with him in order to connect in such a way? So that's when we started to realize that the first step in anything we do is the realization that the bottom line is we have to do the right thing. Whether it's, I mean, obviously within Kedusha, having this concept of, of I have to do the right thing. I mean, uh, I know sometimes eating, like, you know, I'm not necessarily with this group per se, but I'm saying like for certain people, a, a struggle could be that they are constantly having to go, let's say to meetings at work. And it's hard to, to always stand out and stay sneers, or it's hard to say, you know, I can't really come on Chavez, or it's hard to say, I can't really work on the bajillion other days in the year that we can't work on. But the reality is that as long as the, the minimum is I have to do the right thing, then, then we can start our relationship. And it's kind of, you can see it also within a relationship with, you know, hopefully very soon for many of us, a spouse or, you know, family members or best friend or a roommate, or, you know, a roommate. So what is that bottom line? That bottom line is I have to do the right thing, right? Is it the mentally thing to do to, to, to be nasty? No, it's not. Do I have to love her? Not necessarily. I mean, we're going to talk about the love in a minute, but like the bottom, the basis of any relationship you have with anything is to do the right thing for that person. That, that's just it. You know, you can't, you can't be slapping someone in the face and then expecting them to love you. It doesn't work that way. So we have to, the basis of anything is to do the right thing. So that's called Kabbalah soul. Kabbalah soul in regards to Hashem is we have to do the right thing. Hashem asked us to do certain things. So we, we do it. That said, can a relationship last long term on Kabbalah soul? I, ha I hate to say it, but it can't. No matter how much you force yourself, it cannot last in such a, it, such a state. It just doesn't work. Not only that, but you're going you're gonna to be walking around like, as she tabs, it's like a walking chil Hashem. Like you're constantly being pulled. Like imagine you're doing like the stretch and you're constantly on the stretch and you're constantly on the stretch. At some point, you're going to be like, ah! I'm done with this. You're going to, not you, but I'm saying somebody could be like, I'm done with this. I can chuck this thing out. And this is not what we want. And that's why Chabad Chassidus is so focused on taking not just that bottom, you know, the basis of everything. We need to build on it. We need to grow on it. And what, how do we grow from it? We need to add love. 
We need to make a relationship with whatever it is that we're doing. We need to start appreciating. We need to start loving it. Whether it's just plain and simple, we need to love Hashem. It's one of the mitzvahs. We need to, how do we love Hashem? We get to know him. How do we love uh, keeping kosher? We get to learn about keeping kosher. How do we love Shabbos? We get to learn about Shabbos, right? So the more we learn, the more we appreciate what we're doing, the more we build the love. And that, that's kind of where we're holding on the mind, right? The beauty of this love, and not just that, but the, the fact is that our entire godly soul was brought here for us, for it to overturn us to love Hashem. Right, because usually a, a big, and I, I hope everyone did the challenge to see how many, how often they get that pull from the nefesh of Bahamas, and how often they get that, you know, pull from the nefesh of the case. And a lot of our times, we're running on our nefesh of Bahamas uh, on its desires. But in reality, if if we take a moment, and we say, okay, I need to be more conscious about transforming my nefesh of Bahamas to appreciate good things, right? Which is part of what the program we're doing. We're trying to train our nefesh of Bahamas. We're trying to, to make our time count by explaining to our Nefesh Bahamas how amazing it would be for us to go to sleep on time, how amazing it would be for us to dive in a little bit more carefully, for us to learn Chsidis, Kalaka with everybody who's joining today's class. You know, this is our goal, right? Our goal is to build that love, not just fluffy love, but take our Nefesh Bahamas, the selfish, the childish, the immature part of us, and say, you too can be excited about God. You too can be excited about, you know, holy Torah things. Okay, that said, so right, right, we started with a Pasuk, we went on this whole discussion, and now we're trying to pull it back into the Pasuk and say, one second, we still have to learn something else. We have to analyze this Pasuk a little bit further. And part of the Pasuk was this concept of, and you shall serve the Lord your God, none shall miscarry nor be barren. So now we're going to take a moment to analyze what does that mean? Because on the one hand, it is a physical bracha that Hashem is telling us that none shall miscarry or be barren, literally. That said, in order to understand it more with more depth, we need to analyze also what that means in regards to our spiritual world, our spiritual selves, you know, our spiritual connection with Hashem. What does it mean to give birth? And we analyze that, right? And we said, that once you think about something and you truly understand it and you, you, you start to feel a connection with it, then it can give birth to love, to fear, to appreciation, to respect, all of these good feelings, right? But so the same thing as a shidduch date, right? You can't just go out on the first date. And that's why it's such a funny thing that like the outside world talks about falling in love. You don't just like fall in love it's like what are you walking down a hill and plop i fell into it like what in in the whole shidduch system the basis is get to know the person and make sure that the main component is your mindset make sure that everything adds up in your brain so therefore you can grow when the time is right if it is the right person you can grow those feelings of getting to know that person and appreciating them and respecting them and loving them. And, and then those feelings, you know, take root and then it, it grows into a beautiful flower or whatever we want to call it. Right. So, so the, the per, the main thing that like a, a big, big deal in is that you should, everything begins with our mindset, our mindset towards anything. And it's funny because my husband always jokes that what's the difference between someone you you love and someone you hate, it's what you focus on, right? If we take somebody and we really don't like such a person, we're going to start seeing all the negative things because intellectually, we, 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 we don't jive with this person. So then our emotions are going to start noticing all of these things that don't add up. Meanwhile, with somebody we like, intellectually, things add up with this person. It, it, it makes sense. You know, I, I see eye to eye with her. I see that we're, you know, on the same page about certain things. We're able to laugh together and all these things. And so therefore the loving emotions start to take root, right? So everything starts with our intellect. The intellect are the parents and they give birth to our, our emotions. Okay. So now that we understand that, now what does it mean to be barren, right? We understand that giving birth is that the parents, meaning the, the intellect, is able to think about something so deeply that it's able to give birth to an emotion. Now, what does it mean to be barren? So that, that's what we're getting into today. Um, 
I hope that was clear. I hope so. I, and if it needs more clarification, I guess you can ask at the end and then I'll, I'll speak about it more tomorrow. But this is a big deal in regards to knowing what does it mean, his bainanus? What does it mean to meditate? To meditate means to take the time to really think about something and not just leave it in a conceptual, you know, good idea somewhere over yonder. But really think about it and say, take it all, through all the levels of the intellect. First, we need to understand it. So that's chachma. It's like, okay, what, what is this thing? Right? So if I were to describe to you, there's a cylinder. Inside the cylinder, there's an even smaller cylinder. Inside that smaller cylinder, there's this black liquid called ink. And what, there also has a coil. And at one point you click the coil, the inner cylinder comes out of the outer cylinder and that ink is able to turn into, you know, a writing device, right? So the first thing you had to do was understand, okay, let me picture the cylinder. Let me picture the cylinder inside the cylinder. And, and it took a moment to wrap your brain around it. Once you realized, hopefully that I'm talking about a pen, right? So you were able to understand, oh, that's a pen. That means that there's a clicker on the pen. There is probably a little grip. You know, there's, there's, there's the concept of pushing it out. It's not just like a regular pen that you put a cap on it. It's a, it's a retractable pen, right? So you were able to understand so much more. That's called Bina. Once you get the original flash of, okay, what is this? Oh, it's a pen. Then the next level is, oh, now that I know it's a pen, I can understand so many other levels of it. I could also have said that it's purple and it says Levi Chassidus on it and we all love it. So now you're able to understand that. And once you say, oh, I have that pen and it works really well, it's one of my favorite pens, you have an emotional relationship to it. And you say, oh, this I can relate to in, in, in a way that I like it, right? I hope you like it. I personally love it. But that level is called, is called Das connecting to something that that connector piece between the intellectual and you're able to relate to it in a personal sense and you have some sort of beginnings of an emotional relationship with to it that's called das right so the birth process is that first we have to see what's this flat what are you trying to describe which is kind of like a mimer once you learn the mimer you're like we're kind of just like walking around a dark room with a flashlight i'm just showing you guys oh here's the thing and here's the other thing and here's the other thing but the more you learn it the more you see the room all lit up in of itself and you're able to grasp the full thing. Hope that made sense. But that, that's his bindingness, to be able to learn in such a way to take it from step to step and then have a relationship to it. So if let's say for somebody they're struggling with, with you know, having anxiety. So what is Jewish meditation? Jewish meditation is pick something within, within Jewish thought, learn it, not just learn it just to get the original flash of like, okay, what is this book trying to tell me? Learn it one more time and say, okay, now that I know what it's trying to tell me, how can I really understand it? How can I apply this in my life? What does this mean when I, you know, turn off the lights at night and I, and I get a anxiety? What does that mean? Right? So, so that is called his boinanus. That's called meditation. That this is the process that we do. Okay. I know it's a long introduction, but I feel like it, it, it has to happen. Okay, now we're on page 52. Now we're gonna discuss what it means for somebody to not be able to do such a meditation. What does it mean to be barren, okay? Not to be able to give birth. To further clarify this concept, right? The concept that uh, somebody could try and think, or, or what does it mean that somebody could try and think, but the emotions don't come through. They're, they're, we're not getting emotional, we're not getting that. Uh, end result. There are two types of barren women. Okay. The first one, the first does not even possess a womb. Okay. So this actually, again, we're using a, a muscle within the, a, a physical thing to show us something in the spiritual or in a psychological sense. Okay. So the first one does not even possess a womb. In other words, she lacks the means for becoming pregnant in order to give birth. In the service of Hashem, womb refers to intellectual excitement, right? So if, 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 if a person isn't able to get intellectually excited about what they're learning or what they're thinking about, that's a sense of lacking a womb. They're not, they don't have that capability. From which emotions are born and are revealed within the heart, right? So 
if a person is lacking that ability. So for example, if I were to give everybody, I don't know, I don't think anybody in this group knows Chinese, but if I were to give everybody a, a, a book in Chinese, no matter how beautiful and inspirational it is, being that we're lacking the womb, so to speak, to be able to understand Chinese, we, we don't have the tools to be able to give birth to, wow, that inspirational Chinese uh, exciting uh, book, right? We, we, it, it won't be able to give birth. So, so to here. A barren woman who lacks a womb in the service of Hashem corresponds to a situation which not only is there an absence of love and awe revealed within the heart as a result of Timtum Alev, which I'm going to discuss in a minute, but there is not even an intellectual excitement as a result of Timtum Amayach, right? So what does it mean that someone could be lacking a womb? It means that they don't have the intellectual capability so for, to be able to get excited about, that, about this. So when I first started learning Chassidus, I didn't know anything about worlds and symptom and this and Kav and I didn't. So I didn't have the intellectual capability to understand and therefore say, wow, this is so exciting. I'm able to affect Hashem on the level of da-da-da, but not on the level of da-da-da, right? So the more we grow, so to speak, our room, the more, the more we appreciate, the more we learn, the more we know. And the more we know, the more of a greater womb we have to be able to give birth to our emotions. Okay, what does Tim Tumalev mean? It means, and we're gonna, I guess we're gonna discuss it a bit further, yeah. Okay, let me, let's get through, and then it'll explain it a little better. A filled vessel. The cause for absence is that the person is not receptive when he is a full vessel for, natu for naturally, a full vessel cannot contain, right? So you have a cup, you fill it up all the way to the top, and now you're trying to add even more. It, it's not going to go in. It, it just can't. It is already full, right? So a full vessel is not able to receive. When a person is a full vessel, in other words, completely occupied with his own personal wishes, he cannot feel spiritual emptiness. This is huge, right? When we are so self-centered or so self-focused or not even self, when our either our Yetzirah Hara or our Nefesh Bahamas, whichever one it is, causes us to be so focused, just you know, it, looking inside ourselves or looking at what's around us as opposed to looking at the greater perspective and being open, then we're not able to receive anything new, which makes us, quote unquote, for this particular situation, barren in such a way. This is not necessarily because of the desires of his evil inclination that seek the forbidden, or even the wishes of the animal soul that desires what is permissible. For although they are permissible, the desires for them is at least a demon of a Jewish nature. How is it called? Anyway, it doesn't matter, but it's, fun. it's a funny usage of the word, but the meaning translation. So here's how it works, right? If we are so focused on what I want, what I need, what, what makes me feel good, then we're not able to be receptive to what's really needed in this world, what Hashem needs from me, right? So for example, to give a, an example of a boss, right? So if we're so focused on what we think is success at work, then we're not able to pay attention, we're not able to, to, to be in tune with what our boss needs from us. Right? It's possible that we're so, so, so into doing this particular project, but what the boss actually needs us to do is to put that project aside for a little bit, take care of something else, and then possibly come back to it. Right? So we have to be very aware, not just self-aware in the sense of like focused on what I want, how it makes me feel good, you know, how do I use my time in the way that makes me feel amazing, but in reality, we have to realize that there's a boss above us who created us and that boss needs us to do something and if we're able to be sensitive and we're able to set ourselves aside just even just a little bit and empty the cup a little bit to say one second i know that this is what i want to do whether whether the i is your yetahara chasvashalem whether the i is your nefesh bahamas that asks you to do certain things you know it feels really good to binge on social media till three in the morning it feels so much fun but in reality, if we set that aside and say, okay, I know that this is when my, my either Yetzirah or Nefesh Bahamas, depends, whatever, but I know that that's what it wants to do. But in reality, what does Hashem want from me? 
right? We have to move ourselves aside to be able to be able to be able to listen to what others need of us. You know, what whether that other is Hashem, whether the other is your spouse. It's possible that you want to clean the dishes till three in the morning, but what your spouse really wants you to do is come and spend quality time with him. Or what your spouse wants you to do is actually get some sleep so you're not a grouch the next morning, right? So set yourself aside, just, even just a little bit, empty that cup, even just a little bit to be able to receive what's needed of you, not just what you want. But even with regards to the wishes of the godly soul, namely holy desire, so not only, not only can, we, can our cup be over full by our Yetzirah's desires, by our Nefesh of Bahamas' desires, but there are times when our cup can be full by our Nefesh kisses desires, and that's also not good. So let's take a moment to analyze that, okay? If he is full of and involved with his personal desires, convincing himself that he is capable of a specific divine service and therefore wants to engage in, in it particularly, but not in another, then he is a full vessel that cannot contain. He is incapable of grasping the truth within his mind for it to lead to intellectual excitement. Ah, okay. This just blew us away, okay? So not only are we saying that your Yetahar could be pushing you to do things that are not good for you, that we know, granted, okay, we need to set that aside. Not only could your Nefesh of Bahamas be pushing you. And, and again, your Nefesh Bahamas doesn't have necessarily bad desires. It just has selfish desires. So just because you want, you want to ignore the crying baby at four in the morning, four in, four in the morning that spat up all over your bed, just because you want to ignore that child doesn't necessarily make it a good thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. You're not out to get him. It's not a bad thing, but it, it's also not coming from a good place, right? So not only is it that side of us, but also sometimes we think we're very holy and we think we're very, not, we are all very holy, but I'm saying we think we're being extra holy by being focused on one specific thing because it, it feels good. And then saying like, ah, I don't care about that. And, and again, I'm not saying stretch yourself thin. We're, we're all trying to take step by step. Yiddish guide isn't about going crazy all in one shot, right? You can go crazy slowly. I'm kidding. Um, but the reality is that we have to be sensitive about what's needed from us. If at this point, let's say, all I want to do is stay home and learn a mimer, and all I want to do is, you know, focus on my book, but in reality, Hashem needs me to have, have Abbas Yisrael and check in on my friend who's feeling lonely, or, you know, it, it's, it's, it feels good to listen to Shirim all day, but I'm not making time to daven. So one second, we have to take, we have to take a moment to really think, what does Hashem want from me now? Not just what is my, what do I want? What feels good for me? But what does Hashem want from me at this point? And again, that gives us, uh, it opens us up to have this womb, so to speak. It, it, it empties the cup because sometimes we fill our own cup with our own desires. But if we have an empty cup and we're able to receive what's needed from us at this point in time, then we're able to be much more of a Kaylee to feel these emotions, not just feel the emotions, you know, like, Ooh, la la. And like, there's like, you know, butterflies flying and, and, and the popping the hearts all over us. But we're able to actually feel, wow, today I did the right thing. I didn't just do what I wanted to do. I did what was right and what I was needed to do in this world. This is how I use my time. I use my time for the purpose with, for which the Avister created me. And that's why I did, that's what I did today. And how amazing would that be to fulfill the service of Hashem, right? Okay. I hope this made sense. And I hope that the, the, the introduction made sense why it had to be a long introduction to, to get to this point. So can't wait to see you guys tomorrow. Emir to Hashem. And yeah, and literally now for real, the next section, which in this book, it's called page 56, it's called Quintessential Tremor. That one we're going to do in the other book because yeah, it needs a little more explanation. Okay. See you guys tomorrow. Hope you have a wonderful day.